My name is James Warrenberg. I'm a professor at Harvard Law School and the former director of the President's Crime Commission. We're about to take part in a television first, the viewing of an actual trial, filmed as it happened inside a real courtroom and brought to you by public television. The trial took place in the city of Denver, Colorado. I feel it affords a rare glimpse into a process to which our nation is, and I think should be, committed, the attempt to resolve its conflicts not by force, but by rule of law. He's charged with uh, interfering with a police officer, resisting arrest, and causing a disturbance. Three separate charges, each of which could carry a maximum of 90 days in jail and a $300 fine. My understanding of it uh, from my client, and I haven't had an opportunity to talk to the police officer, and, is that uh, the officer, uh, as Lauren was leaving his house this particular morning, the officer shook a fist at him and yelled, white power. Uh, Lauren, I'm sure, responded in kind. Uh, then Lauren uh, got in the car with several other people, uh, started to drive down the alley behind his house. Uh, Lauren indicates to me that uh, several blocks, quite a few blocks after that, he noticed this officer behind him. And Lauren pulled over and stopped. Did you get out of the car? Did he come up to you? Mm, I got out of the car. All right, did he get out of his car? No. You went back to the window. What'd you say to him? I asked him uh, what he wanted. All right, what did he say? Uh, he said, I just want to give you a bad time, Watson. Is that all? Uh, he said something about, uh, I've been uh, waiting for a chance to take care of you. And what did you say? I asked him, uh, Be truthful. I, want to know I asked him, was I, was I under arrest? You know? All right. Did he, he call said, him no. a pig? Or? No, I was very tempted, but I didn't. All right. Did he use uh, any profanity or any uh, racial slurs towards you? Yeah, he called me a black bastard. And... You must understand that uh, in the case of city ordinance violations, the complaints are prepared by laymen in the law, police officers. Therefore, city attorneys in prosecuting ordinance violations are trying cases that they didn't commence that they seldom if ever have had a chance to evaluate the evidence before the charge is filed in other words we take them as they come and of course if there's a case that has a dearth of evidence we dismiss them but if there's any credible evidence from the fragmentary notes that a police officer gives and here's an example of the city attorney's copy of a ordinance complaint uh, we walk into court and we try the case based upon this summary. Once in a while, as in the Watson case, there's even time enough to talk to a witness and find out a little bit more about the case than are reflected in the notes. He was stopped uh, for a traffic violation. After he got out of the car, I asked him for his driver's license. And uh, he said, I don't have to show you my driver's license. You've seen them before, which I had. Anyway, I turned around and went back to the police car to get my citation book. And when I turned around, he's in his car going. So I pursued him and uh, radio, turned the red light and the siren on. And when he wouldn't stop after about a half a block or block, I radioed into the dispatcher that I was uh, involved in a, in a chase with a license number, I guess, a Louisiana car. And about three blocks later, he pulled over and stopped again. And uh, this time he got out and I said, you're under arrest. And uh, he says, I'm not going with no pigs. And uh, he turned and got in the car, and boom, there he goes again. So. Trial. The city and county of Denver versus Lauren R. Watson. Many judges, lawyers, and law professors have taken a strong position against the filming of trials. It's been and continues to be a hotly debated issue. The men who made this film feel they did so without disturbing either the decorum of the court or the process itself. Perhaps you should reserve judgment until you've watched the four days of the trial and then draw your own conclusions. The film follows the course of this trial just as it took place. 
in the order in which it actually happened. Each day has, of course, been edited down from the five or six actual hours, but always in its real chronological order. What's left out is repetition, much of the delay, conferences over minor matters, and sadly, some of the strongest language has been laundered a bit for family consumption. In addition, each of the principals in this case was interviewed before, during, and after the trial, except for the judge who was interviewed only when the case was over. Those interviews are spread throughout the four days, inserted wherever they seem to shed most light. So you're really in a unique position, roughly in the same spot as the various principals who will have to be making decisions throughout this trial, the tactical, legal, and fact factual decisions which will help determine the trial's outcome. And since this is the first time, you might do more than merely watch. I hope you will work. There's no need to think of this trial as a spectator sport. Ask yourself at every point that anyone makes a decision, how would you decide and why? A last word before we begin. In one sense, this might look like a relatively unimportant trial. The maximum sentence for each misdemeanor count actually charged is 90 days in jail and $300. But in some respects, it's a crucially important case. First, what we're about to see is an opportunity for all of us to make some judgments in the trial process itself. Second, it presents one way, and certainly a most hopeful way, that the explosive conflicts in this country are being worked out. For the man who brought the charges is a policeman, and the defender, defendant was Denver's most prominent Black Panther. This confrontation is similar in some respects to that in the recent Chicago conspiracy trial. This trial in a small county courtroom may suggest that one can deal with difficult issues in a very different way. clerk buzzes me when she's ready, and I buzz her back, and then I make a mad dash for the courtroom. show that we are commencing a jury trial in the case of City and County of Denver, State of Colorado versus Lauren R. Watson, alleged two violations of ordinance. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the jury panel, let me very briefly explain the procedure for picking a jury in this court so you will fully understand how we do proceed. Mr. Davies, this is a jury of six, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. The jury that will hear this trial will be a jury consi consisting of six jurors. Now, the method, method of picking is to have the names of six of you chosen. Each side will have a total of three uh, peremptory challenges, three chances to excuse a juror. You may be not one of those picked. You may be one of those excused. You should not in any way feel as though your time is wasted if you are not picked or if you are excused. This is the method in which a jury is picked, a jury panel is absolutely necessary so that the jury system works. Now, um, before I have any of you called, since all of you may be asked questions concerning your competency as jurors, and these questions, by the way, are not to pry into your personal affairs, but to find out uh, whether, in fact, you um, will be a fair and impartial juror as far as one particular side's position is concerned. I would at this time like to have the jury panel as a group sworn to answer all questions truthfully. So with the whole panel, please stand, raise the right hand, and be sworn. 
Through each of you to solve this murder, the evidence in God that you are too anxious to make such interrogatories as may be propounded to you. Touching upon your competency to serve as jurors in the cause now and God before this court. Please answer. Now let me further point out for your information, you see some cameras taking pictures. We do have uh, these gentlemen filming this trial for purposes of a um, educational uh, program on the court systems. This will not be shown on any news shows in the future, but will rather be shown some months from now on national educational television uh, channels. I will be asking some of you questions to see whether any of you might have objections to serving as a juror on a trial that is being filmed, but this is something we will get to in just a little while. So that you do understand what the cameras are, they are not news cameras, this is for a documentary film. At this time, I would ask the clerk to call six names, and as your name is called, have a seat, please, in the jury box, the first name closest to the, uh, to the wall. <coughs> Juror number 91, Don J. Wayne. Juror number 229, James P. McKay. Juror number Mildred E. Watchos. Watches, is that how you pronounce it? Juror number 59, Walter T. Tack. Ladies and gentlemen, I am going to be asking some questions of you initially, then each of the attorneys will be asking questions. Let me request that the other members of the panel that are still seated in the courtroom listen carefully to the questions. At some time in the procedure, you may be asked whether you would have answered questions differently. So think what your questions, uh, what your answers would be. Let me also point out that this, uh, as I stated before, is uh, two charges violation of ordinance. Is it, it is anticipated that this trial will go for longer than one day. It is not anticipated that um, uh, the jurors will be in any way um, required to stay any place for the evening. In other words, you will be released to go home. There'll be no problem concerning, uh, as far as I anticipate, uh, being excused for lunch or to go to your own homes in the evening. Um, let me start out then by asking Mr. Duane, if I may, what your current uh, address is and your occupation, please. 2721 South Fenton Street. What do you do, Mr. Duane? I manage the American Furniture Company on West Colfax. Now, Mr. Duane and other members of the jury panel, I would like to introduce you to both the attorneys that are going to try this case and have the uh, witnesses and defendants, defendant identified for purposes of seeing whether any of you are personally acquainted with the attorneys or with any of the uh, witnesses. Mr. Morgan, would you introduce yourself and state who your witnesses may be? Thank you, Your Honor. My name is Wright J. Morgan. I'm an assistant city attorney, and I'll be prosecuting this case. I have two witnesses, both Denver police officers who are uh, not in uniform in civilian clothes today. <laughs> Officer Cantwell, seated at council table with me, and Officer Frazzini, seated right behind me. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Mr. Davies, would you introduce yourself for the same purpose, please, and witnesses? My name is Leonard Davies. I'm the defense counsel for the defendant, Mr. Lauren Watson. At this point, let me ask the rest of the jurors that I did not ask the question to, do any of you object to the filming of this trial? Anyone that has any objection? All right, I'll turn the board here at this point over to Mr. Morgan, the city attorney. Now, please, the court, Mr. Davies. Um, members of the prospective jury panel, as I'm sure you have uh, deduced from the preliminary questions asked by the court, and uh, additionally, I'm sure that the same basis is true for both the city and defense counsel, we want to emphasize that their only purpose of the questions which we are asking is to try to help us determine, maybe even more importantly, to help you determine whether or not there are any experiences 
or, or factors in your background that might make it difficult for you to serve in this particular case. First, I'd like to tell you what the charge is in this case. There are actually two charges uh, from the same ordinance, which uh, ma makes it unlawful for any person to resist any police officer, any member of the police department, or any person duly empowered with police authority while in the discharge or apparent discharge of his duty, or in any way to interfere with or hinder him in the discharge or apparent discharge of his duty. Now, the court will, at the conclusion of the case, give the jury instructions of the law that apply in this case, among which I assume will be that ordinance. Is there anything in the subject matter of that ordinance that I just read to you that would make it difficult for any of you to sit and serve uh, on a jury? Is there anything whatsoever, first, about the subject matter of the charge that would, just because of the, of the nature of the charge, would influence you toward either side? Uh, let me ask uh, Mr. Duane, is no. there, do you think? And um, uh, Mr. McKee? No. And to save time, the, the rest, is there anything whatsoever concerning the subject matter that makes you feel you couldn't serve? <coughs> Do each of you believe that here in the city and county of Denver that we should have laws or ordinances that make it unlawful within the context of this ordinance to resist a police officer in the performance of his duty or to interfere with him? Is there anyone that feels we shouldn't have a law such as this? The court, in uh, giving the instructions to the jury, I'm certain, will, among other things, instruct the jury that the city and county of Denver, the people of the city and county of Denver, are the plaintiff in this case. Your Honor, we, we would object. Uh, I think the law is clear that it's not the people of the city and county of Denver. It's the city and county of Denver as a corporate uh, body that's bringing these charges, not the people of the city and county of Denver. And I think that's uh, an important distinction. Well, I'd like to, uh, let's see if we can't proceed with the voir dire, and um, uh, if necessary, we will argue this at a later point. I, I think maybe the question can be asked so that we can avoid uh, my having to recess now and ruling on this. I, I would suggest, Your Honor, that counsel wait until I have completed the question to determine whether or not uh, he has an objection. I uh, feel that the question should be completed before there is an objection. I hadn't completed my question yet. All right, Mr. Morgan, would you ask your question, and then I will rule on yes, the objection. Um, as I started to... Uh, Mr. Davies, uh, did you have something else that you wanted to say before I continue? No, I'm going to just save myself a trip. <clears throat> well, it, you, why don't you rest, because it may take a couple minutes before I finish the question. Right. As I started to indicate, as I'm sure the court will instruct you, the entire burden of proof of each of the material allegations of the charges in this case, as to each of them, rest entirely upon the plaintiff, the people of the city and county of Denver. And further, the court, I'm sure, will instruct you that if you find that the city has failed to prove any one or more of the material allegations of a given charge, it would be your duty to return a verdict of not guilty in favor of the defendant as to that charge. Now, is there anything with respect to the substance of such an instruction, if given, that any one of you would feel you could not follow? In other words, are you all in, in agreement that this uh, is the law and should be the law and that you would follow it if you're so instructed? Do you have an objection to the question as restated? I have an objection to the use of the uh, uh, statement that it's the people of the city and county of Denver that are plaintiffs in this case. It is not the people of the city and county of Denver. This gives a suggestion that all of the people in the city and county of Denver have asked Mr. Morgan to prosecute Mr. Watson. That isn't the case at all. It's the city and county of Denver as a corporate body that's bringing the case. And uh, contrary to the way it is under state prosecutions, where it is brought in the name of the people of the state of Colorado, it is not brought in the name of the... There's nothing on the uh, pleadings that show the people of the city and county of Denver as plaintiffs. It's the city and county of Denver as a body corporate 
of bringing the charge. And I think to suggest that it's the people is to somehow cloud the issue and, and somehow prejudice the defendant in this matter. Well, of course, Your Honor, this is so completely uh, insignificant. The I, I think the... Uh, Your Honor, I think the question of whether it's significant or insignificant from my, defend my client, the client's standpoint <laughs> is for us to decide. Let the question be asked now, eliminating the words people of the city and county of Denver. If necessary, I'll have to rule on this. The complaint in this case reads, in the county court, in and for the city and county of Denver. Of course, the court realizes the city and county of Denver is a is not a person, is not a, uh, it's a legal entity only. Let the question be asked without the wording the people, and if necessary, we'll rule on it later. I don't think it's that important. I, I agree, Your Honor. I think it's completely right, let's see if the insignificant. the question can be, uh, uh, can be answered then with this one The change. substance of the question was not so much the word description of the plaintiff as it was whether or not there was anything within the subject matter of the type of instruction that I suggested, if such an instruction were given to you, uh, explaining that the burden of proof of each of the material allegations of the charge rests upon the shoulders of the plaintiff, by whatever word description it may be, it, would each of you follow such an instruction was the question. Generally, could we, I have some sort of a nod of yes or no, you would follow such an instruction. By the same token, if after hearing all of the evidence in the case, as to a given charge, if you were convinced of the truth of the charge beyond a reasonable doubt that the city had proven each material allegation of that charge, would any one of you, as to such a charge, hesitate to return a verdict of guilty? That's just the reverse of the last question. Would you, Mr. Duane? No. And uh, uh, Mr. McKee? No. And... Um, uh, Ms. Mrs. Watches, <coughs> Mr. Cast, no. uh, Mr. Dunn, no. No. and Mr. Geary. No. Now, is there any reason, whether I've inquired of you or not, why you would, any one of you, why you would feel you could not sit as a fair, objective, and uh, impartial jury in this case? Just sort of wrap it up. Any reason whatsoever why any one of you would feel you couldn't serve? Thank you so very much. Your Honor, the city will pass the jury for cause. All right. I think at this point, maybe it would be a good time to take a recess for lunch before we uh, commence voir dire for Mr. Davies. Let me uh, give the panel some instructions, though, before you are excused for lunch. My intention is uh, to uh, allow the jurors to have the lunch period free, to do whatever you want to shop or you may have something you care to do. Uh, I would ask that you not have any communication with anyone concerning this particular trial, that you not discuss it with uh, even any friendly observers who may be in the court, visitors. In other words, I do not want any conversation over the lunch hour about the ordinance referring to interference or resistance or about this particular defendant or about any of the matters which in any way pertain to this trial. Now, you may have discussions among yourselves. You are going to be together there for a few minutes after two, and you can discuss the weather or you can discuss anything you want to except this trial. I would ask that you not discuss this trial. I would also ask that you all return to the courtroom in a, uh, a sober condition so that your minds are uh, fresh and, and uh, ready to commence with the rest of the case. Is there anything further that either attorney wants to bring up at this point? Nothing, Your Honor. All right, with these instructions then, the jurors, the prospective jurors that are now in the box, the panel members that have not been uh, chosen that are in the courtroom, uh, will return to the courtroom at 2 o'clock and meet in the jury deliberation room, which is the room, the meeting room right in back of the courtroom. Until that time, this court will be in recess. Please rise. Court be in recess. You'll notice they're picking a jury panel of only six persons, as permitted by Colorado state law. Rules vary from state to state, but basically what goes on in the voir dire is that each side is permitted to try and persuade the judge that some jurors should be disqualified for cause. 
cause, meaning that because of some possible bias or some other reason the judge can rule upon, it might not be fair to have them sit on that case. Beyond that, each side is permitted three peremptory challenges, opportunities to turn down a juror for any reason it chooses, any reason at all. If any juror is excused as a result of challenge, another name is chosen from the larger group of prospective jurors in the back of the courtroom. So each side can try to tailor the jury to its own advantage. In addition to screening jurors who might be objectionable, this is a point at which the lawyers can begin to try to convey a point of view and in effect give the juror the impression that he's been permitted to remain on the jury on the basis of an understanding between them that the juror will pay, play fair with the lawyer. Mr. Morgan did relatively little on his first contact with the jury. Perhaps he was well satisfied with the jury. Perhaps, because of the pressure of his own docket of cases, he was anxious to get on with the trial and get it over with as soon as possible. We'll see what Mr. Davies' approach is when the luncheon break is over. Will the other members of the panel just have a seat in the first section of the courtroom, please? Uh, with the visitors in the courtroom, please have a seat in the second and third sections and not to sit with the jury panel. <laughs> Morgan, do I recall correctly that you finished your order? It seems, Your Honor, if I recall, I passed the jury for cause. All right. You passed the jury for cause. At this time, then, um, we'll turn the board here over to Mr. Davis. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it's now my uh, privilege to chat with you, we hope, as briefly as possible about some of the things that may or may not determine your uh, qualifications to sit in this particular case. We call this part of the uh, examination, or the trial, I should say, voir dire, which uh, means literally uh, to speak truly. Uh, and of course, that's the idea, is that uh, you, under your oath, will tell us uh, what your attitudes are and so forth with no desire on our part to embarrass you in any way, but rather to uh, get for this person as fair uh, a, ju a jury as he possibly can. After all, this is the, the real mainstay of our system of justice, is the fair a jury trial. Mr. McKay, I think I'd like to direct these questions to you because I want someone to answer them, <laughs> but I want all of you to listen to them, and I think, I hope, think very seriously about how you might answer them, because uh, it's very important to us. Now, Mr. McKee, isn't it true, sir, that you as an individual right now have an opinion as to the guilt or innocence of this man? No, sir. All right. Now, let's think about that a moment. Would any of you answer that question any differently? Do any of you have an opinion as to his guilt or innocence? It may come as some surprise to you, but you should have an opinion as to his guilt or innocence. And I think you'll see why in a moment. Have any of you served on a jury before? Yes. Anyone else? Just uh, Mr. Cast and Mr. McKee, is that right? Oh, and Mr. Dean. Dwayne, is that? That's right. All right. All right, Mr. Dwayne, have you ever served on a uh, criminal jury before? I have. Do you recall them telling you that the defendant was presumed to be innocent? Sure do. In other words, it's a very basic element in our system of justice that a person is presumed to be innocent when he comes to court. Isn't that correct? Now, would any of you, or should, perhaps I should put it this way, wouldn't all of you wish to have that rule of law applied to you when you came to court? That you're presumed to be innocent and the people have to prove your guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Do any of you have any objection to that rule of law? Do you think it's a fair rule of law? Is it a rule that you'd like to have applied to you if you were on trial? All right. Basic guarantees in our system, really. <coughs> All right. So 
then the defendant is presumed to be innocent. And you will consider him to be innocent until you have been, convin been convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that he's guilty. Isn't that true? And if they don't convince you beyond a reasonable doubt, then you will return a verdict of not guilty. Is that accurate in your understanding? Do any of you quarrel with that? All right. All right, now if the defendant is presumed to be innocent, then if at this moment you were sworn in as jurors and you were required to go back into the jury room and deliberate, what would your verdict be? Mr. McKee? You can only be innocent. Not guilty. So at this moment, without hearing anything more, you have the opinion that this man is innocent. He's not guilty. In fact, under our system of law, you have to feel that way, don't you? So you have made up your mind about this man's guilt or innocence. You've made up your mind that he is innocent. And you're going to continue with that view until that person, through his evidence, shows him to be guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Isn't that right? Would any of you quarrel with that concept? Again, I'll ask you, is it a concept you'd like to have applied to you if you were on trial? Sure. And will all of you assure this man that you will uh, follow those concepts in this case and give him the benefit of those concepts just as you would wish to have them given to you by a, a jury? Is that right? Mr. Duane, how long have you lived in uh, Denver? 13 years. How long have you worked for American Furniture Company? 10 years. Do you have any children? Are you married? Mm -hmm. Do you have any children? <coughs> yes, I do. Could you tell me their ages, please? I have two daughters, one 21 and one 22. All right. And they uh, spent their years in Denver, their uh, high school years, for instance. Sure Where did they go to school? Here we come. Uh, Lincoln and Kennedy. Right. Mr. McKee, may I ask you generally the same questions? Are you married, sir? Single. Single? How long have you lived in Denver? 53 years. 53 years? All right. Ms. Wachus, I understand your husband <coughs> makes electrical fixtures for... Uh, to Seacrest. Seacrest, is that right? Yes, sir. Do you have any children? No. No children. How long have you resided in Denver? All my life. Mr. Dunn, are you married, sir? Why, sure, yeah. Do you have any children, sir? Yeah, I have one son. How old is he now? 23. How long have you resided in Denver? 25 years. You all realize that while in a civil case, one side may prevail over the other side by showing more by showing greater evidence, just tipping the scale a little bit. But that's not true in a criminal case. In a criminal case, they, they must prove, the, the city must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, in fact, committed uh, the alleged crime. He doesn't have to do a thing. He doesn't have to say a word. He doesn't have to go forward with any evidence whatsoever. Do any of you have any quarrel with that, that concept, that basic concept? <coughs> now then, now Mr. Cast, you've noticed, I'm, I'm sure you've noticed, that the defendant's a black man. Isn't that right? That's correct. Now, I suppose you've noticed, and if you haven't noticed, I wish you'd look about you. You'll see that all of the jurors are white. Is that right? Now, the question I have for you is if you were on trial in this chair, would you have any objection to be tried by an all-black jury? No. I'm going to object to this question, Your Honor. Uh, I think it's uh, an incompetent uh, question. I don't think it's a question uh, that uh, uh, necessarily uh, deals with the uh, 
any suggestion of bias on the part of the juror. I think the substance of the question could be asked in a proper form, but in the form of the question, I feel it's incompetent. The uh, objection will be overruled. The question will be answered. Thank you, Your Honor. In other words, Mr. Cast, you feel that there would be no problem, as far as you're concerned, uh, in being tried by uh, an all-black jury if you were on trial. You'd have no qualms about it? All well, I'm interested in is facts. Good. How about the rest of you? Would any of you have any, uh, just for a moment, wouldn't it uh, perhaps uh, give you a start? Ms. Watchhouse, you? Mr. Dunn, how would you feel? Wouldn't bother you a bit. No, it wouldn't bother me at all. All right. Gary? <coughs> Dwayne, how about you? It would not bother me somewhat. All right. How about you, Mr. McKee? You'd wonder. Couldn't help but wonder. All right. Sometimes these things that we've lived with for a long time are difficult to set aside. All this man can do through me is rely upon your honesty and your candidness. And I think the only thing to do is that knowing you have that possible opinion, if you were on trial and someone who felt that way, just the way you feel today, if they were sitting in that chair, would you turn to me and say, hey, Davies, get her off of there? You think that you could do it all right? There's nothing wrong now, you understand, in, in saying that. The question is whether or not we're going to get the best jurors we can. Sure. If you had the authority and, and ability and were permitted to either keep yourself on the jury or take yourself off the jury, at this point, what would you do? Would you, would you take yourself off the jury? Uh, Your Honor, I'm going to have to object to this. Uh, I don't think this is a question that the juror is competent to answer. It's a matter for the court to rule in the exercise of its discretion whether or not the uh, attitudes and the responses of the juror render the juror incompetent uh, for cause. And I don't think the juror can answer for Let herself. Let me make sure I really understand the question. Are you still asking her whether she would do this were she the defendant, or are you just asking her a general question? Well, Your Honor, if a person sits up there and says, I have a certain uh, back condition. The judge doesn't inquire, make a medical examination. They ask the juror, is it so bad, is the pain so bad that you can't sit on the jury? And I'm asking her if her mental state is so bad that she feels she couldn't sit and render a fair verdict. I think it's a perfectly proper question. If you question. will, if that were the question, I wouldn't object to right. it. If you will restate your question. Well, it was the question, and he did object to it, yeah. Your Honor. The objection will be sustained to the question as originally asked, as subsequently asked, and may be answered. You think you can sit fair and impartial? Right. That's all we ask, I might add. Now, do any of you, uh, uh, members of the jury, have uh, any beliefs and attitudes uh, or feelings that uh, are based upon uh, or drawn uh, uh, just on uh, racial lines? I'm going to object to the form of that question. I think it's so broad and ambiguous that an answer would be susceptible to as many different possible interpretations as the question is broad. I have no objections to counsel, as he may properly do, inquiring if any member of the jury would uh, allow any feeling of racial bias if they have any to enter into the case. That's very proper. But the form of the question was so broad that the answer could mean anything. The question is broad. However, I'm going to allow the question to be asked and answered if the jurors can answer it. The objection will be overruled. Do any of you belong to any clubs or organizations or something like that that practice as a matter of, uh, of uh, rules and, uh, in fact, practice racial discrimination? <coughs> Shall I assume from your, the lack of response that none of you do?
Can we assume then from your answers that uh, there will be no consideration in this case uh, based upon color? None whatsoever. If you were on trial today, would you be willing to have a person that shares your frame of mind, that, that thinks the way you think? Would you be willing to have that person sit in judgment of you? Well, I think so. All right. Mr. Dunn, I'd like to ask you the same question. I believe I would. Mr. Cast? I don't have no answer. Well, let's explore that for a moment. Could you tell me why you don't have an answer? Well, let's hear the question again. If you were on trial today and there was someone in your seat with the same attitudes and feelings and frame of mind that you have today, would you be willing to have that person uh, try your case? How are they, they going to know what frame of mind I'm in? Well, you know, and that's what we want to know. That's the important thing. And that's the only, all I'm trying to do is find out whether you think it's a good enough frame. Before, I'm just interested in facts. What about this idea? What about the idea that a lot of people have that if he hadn't done something wrong, he wouldn't be in this courtroom today? Do you share that at all? Well, I probably wouldn't be here either. If he hadn't done anything wrong? I probably wouldn't be on the jury. If he hadn't done something wrong? Well, I don't know about that. Well, that's exactly what we're trying to get at, Mr. Cash. <laughs> That's exactly what we're trying to get at. Do you feel that a person isn't brought into court and charged unless he did something wrong? Basically, is that, is that how you feel generally as a general matter? That's the only reason he's here. He's just charged with something. All I want to hear is the facts. All right, if I understand the uh, juror's question right, I would ask that he be uh, excused for cause. Well, of course, I have to oppose this, Your Honor. The law is, is very clear that even if a prospective juror had an opinion concerning the guilt or innocence of a defendant, if his testimony on voir dire is that he would uh, set aside any such opinion and decide the case on the law and the evidence, he is not incompetent to serve. And there hasn't been anything near like that sort of testimony with respect to this juror. The only thing that he has done so far is to state that he could not give an answer to counsel's question as to whether or not he would like to have a juror with his frame of mind sitting in judgment of himself. And that's not the same thing as indicating any opinion as to the guilt or innocence of the defendant. Let me ask uh, Mr. Cass because I'm not quite sure what he's saying. Um, Mr. Cass, the question was asked of you, and it is an important question, uh, of whether you think that uh, the defendant must have done something wrong or he wouldn't be here. Do you have, honestly, this feeling? Well, it appears that's the reason he's here. Well, that he, because he's done something wrong or because he's been charged with doing something wrong? I think this is the, the difference that the uh, attorneys are trying to draw. Well, I don't know, but it seems that I'm here to find out the facts so that I can make an, uh, uh, get the way this balance the scales to see whether it was right or wrong. Mr. Cass, do you understand that people may be charged with doing something wrong. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're guilty. Uh, do you feel that this does not mean that they're guilty? That's, that's what I said. I, said I think we have doesn't... a communications problem, Mr. Davies, and I will, uh, at this point, at least deny your uh, challenge and ask you to continue with the board here. All right, thank you, Art. <laughs> Mr. Cast, I would like to pursue it just one, uh, just for a couple of more questions, and that simply is this, that there isn't any question in your mind about the value of the rule of law that says a man is presumed to be innocent, right? All right. So what you're saying is, as I understand it, is that obviously there was some set of circumstances, some set of facts 
that caused somebody to charge a some person with something. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he did whatever or was responsible or was guilty of that. Uh, He's innocent until proved guilty as far as I'm concerned. All right, fine. That's all we ask. Are any of you familiar with Mr. Watson, uh, either through radio, television, press? Have you read about him or heard about him or seen his picture on the news? Or Any of you? You did yesterday? No, not yesterday. I said I have. Well, In the past. Four or five months ago or so. Okay, but none of the rest of you have ever heard his name before. He... Cast, have you, uh, are you familiar with... Uh... I've just seen it in the paper, that's all. Have any of you read about this specific case? The date of the offense was the sixth day of uh, <coughs> November of 1968, day after Election Day. Okay. Mr. Dunn, to some of the concepts that we've talked about here, uh, presumption of innocence, a reasonable doubt, resolving questions in favor of the defendant when you have some question about them, all of these things, do they come as any surprise to you? I mean, the questions that you asked? Yes. Some of them, no. Yeah. All right, I have one last question. It's been asked before, but there's been some new ground covered. <coughs> do any of you, as sworn uh, venirement, sworn prospective jurors, and with that oath in mind, and searching your conscience and your background and so forth, is there any reason why any one of you feel not only that you couldn't sit in this case, but maybe that you shouldn't, in all honesty. Any one of you? I won't go into it, if, but I would like to know. Do any of you feel that maybe you shouldn't, maybe there's something gnawing at you, that maybe you just shouldn't sit? Anything at all? We'll accept the jurors for cross. Morgan, your Christopher in for a challenge, please. Uh, your Honor, with respect to the jury is now sitting in the box, the city will accept the jury will offer the challenge. I'd like a moment, if I may. Yeah. Excuse juror number two, Mr. McKee. We would excuse juror number two, Mr. McKee. And, uh, back in the courtroom, please. Would you call another juror, please? Juror number two, Mr. McKee. Walter C. Shaw. Mr. Shaw, if you would please resume the Seat left vacant. Mr. Shaw, may I ask your current address and occupation? 2137 South Clark. What? I'm a chipper uh, in the foundry uh, General Iron. Uh, which, fo which foundry did you say? General Iron. General Iron? Yes. Mr. Shaw, are you acquainted with either attorney or with any of the other parties introduced? No. Uh, your voice is a little hoarse. Are you, yeah, uh, do you have a cold or is this? Oh, it's a little uh, frog in my throat. Nothing which would... Uh, ...yourself to decide uh, the case because you might form uh, either a strong liking or dislike for, let's say, either the attorneys on either side or any of the witnesses on either side or, as I think Mr. Davies has emphasized on the uh, color of any witness's uh, skin or any other factors other than the law and the evidence. You understand this and you are in agreement with the spirit of this whole thing, are you not? Yes. All right, sir. Thank you so much, Your Honor. The city will pass Mr. Shaw for cause. Davies, for you. Bench. Yeah, uh, mid-afternoon 
break. I was just might be this moment time. thinking about it. Well, was I sure that he was two minutes it. ahead of me, but I should have Yeah, I think we should uh, take a short break. How long do you... Uh, well, I've been to uh, first uh, Oh, uh, fine. Doesn't matter. I'm, I, I don't want to make it in the middle of my floor, Jerry. Okay. No, I agree, right. Your right. Your this is an appropriate time. All right. Fifteen at the moment. I think everyone needs a... Uh, a moment or two to stretch their legs before we continue with uh, more for dear. This may take uh, uh, considerably more time. I'll just take that back with me. So at this time, we are going to, um, I'm just wondering, gentlemen, if we should take a long enough break so that any of the jurors, if they desire, can go down and have a quick cup of coffee. The individual, Zeta Weinshank, is absolutely different and apart from the judge in the black robe. And it has to be. Someone once said that uh, perhaps the black robe should be discarded. And it has been argued that it's a good idea to have a black robe because it lets the other people know that you're a judge, that you're a symbol. Um, perhaps the real reason for wearing the black robe is not so much to remind other people that you're a judge, but to remind yourself that you are a symbol. Uh, and you have to divorce yourself as a judge from yourself as an individual. Again, it's the same old question. You may very well feel very sympathetic towards a defendant, may feel very strongly uh, uh, in sympathy with a person, and yet the case must be decided according to the law, no matter how you feel as an individual. Um, the law is as it functions, uh, that the rich, only the rich have the right to, to steal. <laughs> Uh, or to lie, or to cheat, or to... Only the rich have the right to break the Ten Commandments. Um, that only uh, the rich have any justice in the courts, because it's their courts, you know. I don't think any of us know of any case where a millionaire was ever convicted of murder, you know, or where any of the antitrust boys who robbed uh, the people of millions and millions of dollars, or rather the trust, you know, guys of the big corporations who've been convicted, but the guy, you know, uh, gets maybe a year probation or something like that. And he's a guy who's robbed millions and millions of people of millions and millions of dollars. Lauren, can a man who isn't white or middle class get justice in the courts? No. No, well, please tell me. Well, because it's, uh, People who are not white in this country, it's a white nationalist country. And people who are not white are subjects. And it's simply a case of a subject attempting to get justice in the master's court. And um, that the master, of course, never gives justice to the slave or to the subject because this would uh, elevate the slave the subject to the position that he wants to hold for himself. Does the fact that the Negro, uh, that the defendant is black have any bearing in this case at all? As far as no. you're concerned? No. Or that the officer is white? No. In other words, it's meaningless, isn't it? To me. Do you belong to any organizations or clubs that practice, uh, have a policy of racial discrimination? No. you were going to join a club and you found out it did have that policy, would you not join it for that reason? Yes. I may be making a big mistake, but I, I just think that he is. Uh, <clears throat> just got to go. I'll be right. See, we've only got two. I don't know what the hell. Who's it going to be? Oh, this guy. I don't mind this guy too much. Excuse juror number four, Mr. Cast. Again, let me point out that if you are excused, please don't feel your time has been wasted. This is uh, extremely important to have a panel available. Would you call a new juror four, please? Juror number 27, Mrs. Virginia L. Blackman. Mrs. Blackman, would you resume the seat left by uh, Mr. Cast, please?
Now, Mrs. Blackman, let me uh, start out by asking you some questions. Uh, first of all, your current address. And your occupation, please. I do electronic assembly at Honeywell. Do you know of any reason why you could not serve as a juror? No. All right, Mr. Morgan, I'll turn the voir dire over to you at this point. Do you understand the city is not required to, to prove beyond a reasonable doubt every fact that may be alluded to during the trial, but is only <coughs> required to prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt the material elements of the charge? All right, now, if you are convinced beyond a reasonable doubt as to those material elements, you believe that they're true beyond a reasonable doubt, even though you might entertain some doubt as to collateral matters that were not material elements, would you have any hesitation whatsoever in returning a verdict of guilty as to that charge concerning which you are convinced beyond a reasonable doubt? You would, would you have any hesitation? No, sir. Well, then, I think I've asked this question of the other jurors, but I'd like to ask specifically again of you, Mrs. Uh, Blackman. May I safely assume that you will make a conscious effort to refrain from deciding the case on any collateral matters other than the law and the evidence. Yes, sir. All right. And as I illustrated previously, this could encompass all sorts of things, such as whether you like the way Mr. Davies or myself comb or don't comb our hair, the color shirt we wear, or whatever. Solely the law and the evidence, is that correct? Yes. All right. Is there any reason that you can think of why you could not serve as a completely fair and objective an impartial juror in this case. Any reason whatsoever that you feel you could not so serve? Thank you so very much, Your Honor. The city will pass Mrs. Blackman for cause. Thank you. Mr. Davies, Vordier. Thank you, Your Honor. You've been here all day, Miss Blackman. Mm -hmm. Is there anything, as far as you know, in your background that would lead you to place undue emphasis on a police officer's testimony? just because he was a police officer, mm -hmm. and vice versa. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't detract from it just because he was a police officer. I don't believe so. Now, let me ask you this question, and once again, it's a new question that hasn't been asked of a panel before, so if there is some answer contrary, I would like to hear it from all of you. You go into the jury room, you take a vote. It's five to one, let's say in this case for conviction or acquittal, it doesn't matter, but it's five to one, and you're the one. Would you say, well, five to one, if something's wrong, uh, I guess I'll change my vote. Would you do that? Or would you ask and require the rest of the people to convince you? If you're convinced beyond a reasonable doubt of his, that he is uh, uh, not guilty, or, uh, or you're not convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that he is guilty, which is more proper, and the vote is five to one. Would you change your vote just because the vote was five to one? Or do you think you could stick with your conviction until it was overcome by uh, discussion? I have to make up my own mind at that time. Yeah. You know. All right. I wouldn't change this just because everyone were out. Okay. No. All right. In other words, a substantial portion of this young man's life is more important than a, uh, than a dinner date or whatever it might be, right? All right. And you're not going to let those extraneous uh, considerations weigh. In other words, you're, you're committing yourself to sit on this jury, right? And you're going to do it for as long as it takes you to do it. Uh, all right. We'll accept this juror for cause, Your Honor. All right. Jurors accepted for cause. Mr. Morgan, do you have a peremptory challenge? The city will accept Mrs. Blackman, Your Honor. Mr. Davies, your third peremptory challenge. The problem is now that this is it. If we get on the next one, is uh, you know, we're stuck with it.
exercise or challenge, Your Honor, we would ask to be heard on the motion in chambers or in, out here outside the presence of the jury. I still love you. I don't know. We'll take a uh, very short recess to chambers. Before we recess, let me uh, let me very specifically point out uh, so the jurors will understand uh, that the jury that will be picked will be the finders of the fact. The court determines questions of law on all motions referring to questions of law. These are heard outside the hearing of the jury or the prospective jury. So why don't you just go ahead uh, and make your motion. If anybody does want to smoke, since we're in, well, let's see. Did you want to smoke? I would like to, if I may. I, I have no objection, since we're in the chambers. So we're on the record, but uh, informal. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, at this time, I would like to, with some modification, uh, remove, renew a motion previously filed in the case with regard to the jury array, only this time to the jury panel selected in this case. Uh, while it was our contention in the first uh, motion that the entire jury panel was so unrepresentative of the community that Mr. Wasink could got, not get a jury of his peers, we're now narrowing the motion down to uh, the fact that uh, after viewing, finding out who the panel was, consisted of, and not having been privy to the actual selection of this panel and not knowing how it was selected, since that wasn't gone into before. And with some modification, uh, remove, renew a motion previously filed in the case with regard to the jury array, only this time to the jury panel selected in this case. Uh, well, it was our contention in the first uh, motion that the entire jury panel was so unrepresentative of the community that Mr. Wasink could got, not get a jury of his peers. We're now narrowing the motion down to uh, the fact that uh, after viewing, finding out who the panel was, consisted of, and not having been privy to the actual selection of this panel and not knowing how it was selected, since that wasn't gone into before. And we think the court can take judicial notice, one, from seeing the panel, that they are all considerably older than the defendant, among other things, just from a visual standpoint. And from those who have been on the panel and those who remain, but who have been designated through numbers, none represent uh, the uh, Negro race. All are obviously from a relatively high socioeconomic group. None are from a geographic location from which Mr. in which Mr. Watson resides and spends most of his time. And that this panel, in our view, is because of its construction and because of its obvious background and areas of residence is totally opposed to the concept of jury of one's peers in this particular case. That, in essence, is, is the motion. It's just simply not a jury of this man's peers in any way, shape, or form. It can't be. Well, Your Honor, uh, with respect to the narrowed ar argument, which is similar in substance to the uh, original challenge to the array, I will merely uh, recall to the court the rule in uh, the latest cases that we have digested in Colorado, uh, Watts versus U.S. in 212 Federal 2nd 275, uh, which was from the uh, uh, Court of Appeals uh, from the District of Colorado, uh, the holding, and I'm, I'm reading just from the uh, digest, Your Honor. Uh, a defendant who has been charged with a criminal offense is not entitled to any particular jury so long as a fair and impartial jury of qualified jurors is selected and defendant is not deprived of his right to exercise his uh, peremptory challenges. Now, Your Honor, the uh, mere fact that uh, in this particular uh, panel there were no members of the Negroid race 
does not uh, imply that there was any uh, unfair selection of the panel uh, in itself. I don't think there's any law uh, that counsel could find anywhere that uh, recites that a member of a given uh, major ethnic group, or as it's loosely called, race, uh, is entitled to any percentage or proportion from zero to 100 of members of his own uh, ethnic group. Uh, I think that probably uh, we have been using the term, maybe I have, the term race somewhat loosely. I really understand there's only one race, the human race, and that there are, are three major identifiable ethnic groups, Caucasian, Mongoloid, and Negroid. But regardless of that, I don't uh, know, and I think the burden is upon Mr. Davies to show to the court some law uh, in support of his proposition, which I think that the uh, renewed uh, motion uh, should be denied for similar reasons to those already gone into uh, previously by virtue of the evidence adduced uh, on the original motion to challenge the array. Across uh, the array. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Do you wish to make any rebuttal arguments? Yes, Your Honor. I, 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 three or four points come to me. First of all, uh, as to Mr. Morgan's argument about the court shouldn't do it without some law, if that were the case, then I suppose the case of Gideon against Wainwright would have never been decided because it was new law. The case of Mapp versus Ohio would never have been decided because it was new law. The case of Escobedo and Miranda would never have been decided case of Wade and case of Gilbert would never have been decided because they were, they made law. And we don't contend that we should have black people on the jury, necessarily. We think that a fair sample, if it were a fair system, there would be some black people on the jury. But that's not, neither here nor there. We're going to all the other factors that seem to be involved in this particular panel. And I can't believe that this court could say that they've, uh, that this isn't a panel that does not, that in fact reflects uh, accurate cross-section of the community and, and, and is a, in any way a peer group from that standpoint to Mr. Watson. That's all we have. All right, thank you, Mr. Davies. I might add one thing, Your Honor. This panel, what this panel will do is deny the, the, the defendant a right to a jury trial, uh, an effective jury trial a jury of his peers because he'll have to waive this jury. Well, number one, uh, the jury is not yet picked. You have yet one peremptory. Uh, number two, there are several working people on the jury panel. Uh, there is at least one of those prospective jurors who is a rather young man. Uh, but in all honesty, um, even though I perhaps agree with your statement of fact that by chance, whatever the chances are, that we do have uh, uh, people on the prospective jury panel who uh, geographically are not from Northeast Denver, and I'm just looking at the address of Mr. Watson, a state on the complaint, who for the most part are older than Mr. Watson, who are not black, who are perhaps, uh, well, I don't know what his economic situation are, but most of them are uh, perhaps middle class, although there are working people. Nevertheless, the court feels that the law is as stated by the city attorney. Um, let me further say this, as far as your citing of the, of the uh, new law created by courts, sometimes uh, it does make a difference uh, whether one sits in a position of being a county court, a trial judge, or whether one sits on the Supreme Court, uh, the county judge, at least, is, a position, is in a position to follow what the law is as stated by the Supreme Court of the state. I feel that the law is as stated by the city attorney on this point, and therefore there is no sufficient grounds to quash the jury panel. For these reasons, your motion will be denied, your objections, your motion is on the record and will be preserved for whatever purposes uh, the record is kept for. At this point, I would like to uh, reconvene in the courtroom and resume the final picking of the jury and uh, 
let you decide whatever you desire to do in this case. I think probably you're going to have some time to think about it because I don't think we're going to start the evidence this evening. We'll probably just pick the jury and Parent, recess till tomorrow morning. Parenthetically, Your Honor, I would certainly hope not at eight minutes to five. Okay, I would like to see if we can complete the uh, picking of the jury. All right, unless there's anything further, the court will recess this in chambers session and we'll reconvene to the courtroom. Fine, Your Honor. But, uh, excuse juror number six, Mr. Geary. Mr. Geary, you may be excused and have a seat uh, back in the courtroom. Would you pick one other juror, please? Juror number one, one, eight. Charles W. Gable. Mr. Gable, may I ask your uh, address and occupation, please? Uh, 1450 South Newton, stationary engineer for what? Metal Gold Dairies. Metal Gold? Mm -hmm. What does a stationary engineer do, sir? Oh, that's uh, steam boilers, refrigeration equipment, maintenance. Do you believe that after you shall have been instructed upon the law, if there should be some aspect of the law with which you might be in very strong disagreement, such as the substance of the ordinance or any other of the instructions of law, to the point where you felt that if you had the power to pronounce the law, you'd say the law should be just the exact opposite of what you've been instructed upon. Do you believe, sir, that having taken an oath to do so, that you would be able to follow the law as you shall be instructed upon it, even if you disagreed with it strongly? Could you do that, sir? I believe I could. All right, so that's really what we're talking about. Uh, now, my question is, have you had any such contacts with law enforcement officers? Either way, that would make you accept as gospel anything a police officer said because he has a badge, if he told you the sun was shining at midnight, you knew it wasn't so, you'd believe it anyhow, to cite a ridiculous <coughs> example, or the other way, that you wouldn't believe a word he said because he's an officer. This is the type of thing we're talking about. Do you have any such uh, contacts or feelings? No. Either way? No, no, either, either way on that. Do you have any children, Mr. Gable? I have three. Is it Gable, by the way? Is that yeah. correct pronunciation? You have three? Three. What are their ages, sir? 21 and 18. I thought you said three. Huh? I did. There's twins. Oh. <laughs> I knew he was going to ask that. I did. <laughs> I thought maybe it was a favorite joke. <laughs> Is there, are the twins the 18 or the, the 20? The twins are the 18. Boys or girls? Boys. All right. How about the older one? Is that a He's boy? a boy. All right. You were in the courtroom while we were talking with the other uh, jurors, were you not? Mr. Yeah. Gable, uh, did you hear? Were you able to hear all of the uh, all of the questions? Every one of them. Did um, do you feel there's any different uh, answers that you might give, or any different attitudes? Any, anything you feel differently about? No, I don't believe so. Mr. Gable, if you were instructed that one can resist an unlawful arrest, would you? Agree with that? I'd go along with it. Would you follow it, whether you go along with it or not? No, I'd follow it. All right. And if you were instructed that a person can interfere with the unlawful arrest of another, whether you agree with it or not, would you follow it? Uh, Your Honor, I'm going to have to object to this, and maybe we could solve this problem by a momentary approach uh, mm -hmm. of the bench by counsel. I think that there's a, a way in which Mr. Davies can ask this question without objection, but in its form, I must object. May I briefly see both the attorneys at the bench, please? Out of the hearing of the jury. <laughs> the reason is the charge in the ordinance makes it unlawful for any person to interfere with a police officer in the discharge or apparent discharge of his duty. And I think if we got into a situation, I don't know if we will in this case, where the evidence could, according to counsel's question, let's assume that it could show an arrest that 
was legally invalid. But if by the same token at the time the officer was attempting the arrest, he appeared to be in the apparent discharge of his duty, it would still be unlawful to interfere. And this is the point to which I was making all of my objections. If the counsel will frame his question along those lines, I'll have no objection. But you see, one could... Well, uh, if he were to add the words, not in the apparent... Well, I see the apparent uh, discharge. All right, all right. I, I, I would like to hear the argument on this, of course, at a later point. Can the questions... Uh, what you're asking me to do, really, at this point is to... Uh, commit yourself uh, to an instruction. Commit myself to an instruction, and I hate to do this if, if there is opposition you're here. To a, you're committing yourself to an instruction. I'm saying if you're instructed on this point, if they're not instructed, then they can forget the whole thing. But you are committing yourself to an instruction by upholding his objection. You're saying, no, I'm not going to instruct that way, so forget it. In this case, hypothetical state of the instructions, and it's not that clear cut. Look, as both of you know, I haven't been in this particular car too long, and I'm going to have to f refresh myself on the law. My position has always been on poor dear to a jury that you may ask if a certain instruction is given, but if it is contested between the attorneys, whether or not that exact statement may be the statement given, then I will not permit the question to be asked. The objection will be sustained, and I think you can restate your question so as to avoid any problems, Leonard. All right. Mr. Gable, do you have any quarrel with the concept that at this moment you have a conclusion about the guilt or innocence of the defendant? At this particular moment, no quarrel at all. In other words, as right now you're convinced of the defendant's guilt, uh, innocence. Right now he's innocent. Right. And you'll continue to feel that way, Mr. Gable, until you've been convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. Right. Now, Mr. Gable, I asked the other jurors this question. I want to ask you this question. If you were on trial here, one, would you be willing to have a person feeling the way you do sit in that box? I'd be perfectly willing. All right. On the other hand, if you were sitting on trial here today, would you be perfectly happy to have six uh, black people sitting as your jury? It would make no difference. Absolutely no difference whatsoever. And without, you can say that without hesitation. How about if you were in... Uh, a country where 20% of the people were white and 80% of the people were black, would you still feel that that would be no, uh, that you'd have no problem? That wouldn't I'm going to have to object to this question, Your Honor. This goes into a, into a hypothesis, which it's is... It's not a hypothesis. 20% of the people in this country are black and 80% are white. Now... And to make the question a valid one, we can all, we have to reverse these circumstances. Uh, Your Honor, I have an objection before the, the court. Let objection and then I realize. My objection was very simple, Your Honor. The question imposes a hypothesis not involved in this case. Now, counsel asked the question if the juror lived in a country where a certain hypothetical percentage of the population were as proposed. This is a hypothesis not involved in this case, and the question does not touch upon the competency of the juror. The objection will be overruled. The question may be asked. Do you remember the question, Mr. Gable? All right, what would your answer be, sir? It'd be the same. It wouldn't bother you. Is that because, Mr. Gable, that you know that as a white man, you can sit in judgment of a black man without any degree of influence by virtue of the fact that you're white and he's black? Is that why, is that why you feel, and you feel the reverse would be true too, right? Right. He's just like the rest of us. He's a man. Do you firmly believe that, Mr. Gable? Always have. All right, we have no other questions here. We'll pass this chair for cause. Morgan, do you have a preliminary challenge to me? Well, Your Honor, we will accept uh, juror number six. The jury is presently constituted will be the jury that hears the trial. At this point, since the hour is past five, we are going to recess. I would like to instruct the uh, Prospective jurors, we are going to swear you tomorrow morning when you report back, and I would ask each of you to report to this courtroom by 10 o'clock. Would you report either to Mrs. Dondelinger, the bailiff, um, 
Let's see, are you going to have this room free tomorrow so we can have them just uh, meet? I think the easiest thing to do is to meet directly in the what will be the jury deliberation room, which is the room where you met in today. Let me further instruct you, again, very carefully, that you are not in any way to communicate with either attorney, with any of the witnesses, with the defendant, <clears throat> on any matters. No communication at this point with any of the involved people. I would ask you not to attempt in any way to do any reading or research concerning either the defendant or the facts of the case, uh, which you have not heard anything about yet. I would ask you also this evening not to read any newspapers and not to listen to any news broadcasts. We want your mind free and ready to hear this particular case tomorrow. At this time, the court will be in recess until tomorrow morning. Please rise. The rest of you jurors may report back up to the jury room at 8.30 in the morning, those of you that have been excused. <laughs> against us. They're all white. They're all middle class. They're all from a, a, a different geographical area within the city. What can we do? Can I seriously think we ought to seriously consider waiving the jury tomorrow and going to the judge? It's just like completely stacked. My client and I are debating very seriously the idea that we've exhausted all our challenges. We only had three peremptory challenges to select a jury of six. We feel that we haven't been able to select a jury of his peers. And we're uh, very seriously debating the question of tomorrow waiving the jury and trying the case to the court. One of the reasons that uh, the, my client, Mr. Watson, agrees with this is that with our feeling that we don't have a jury of our peers, then to go ahead and nevertheless try it to that jury would at least implicitly saying that, that we really aren't convinced that we don't have a jury of our peers, that we're willing to, to go ahead with it. We're not sure we wouldn't rather say we don't have a jury of our peers, and if we don't have a jury of our peers, we may, not have a, may as well not have a jury at all, and we'll go to the court and take our chances. Well... As far as the manner in which the day went, uh, I was rather uh, pleasantly surprised uh, from prior experience that we were able to achieve a jury selection as rapidly as we did. I do not feel that I am competent to pass upon the quality of the jury. Uh, in the first place, I'm not sure what is meant by this. They were all legally competent. Uh, there were, as you can see, none uh, whom I felt were incompetent by virtue of any bias or prejudice. As you noticed, I challenged none of them. In this particular jury, I didn't frankly notice any jurors that stood out as, as being extremists in, uh, from any point of view. I, think, I thought they were a, a very average uh, extremely random jury. I would characterize them as uh, not examples of any sort of extremism. And of course, I, I would think that either side would not want extremists. We all can't sit on the jury because I know you've probably uh, seen a case come back guilty or not guilty. And you, boy, if I was a jury, you know, according to what I've seen, I'd found him guilty. Or I don't see how to convict a guy like that. See, so. We're not, and we don't know what the facts were, and they have the facts. And uh, I think I'd, if I was a judge, I'd rather have a, a jury than it wouldn't turn right to me and say, you know, you're the judge, you make the decision. But you made the arrest on the case. Do you, do you feel that, that how would you, would you rather have that be a jury or a judge? Oh, I'd rather go to a judge. I'd rather go straight to a judge. More, uh, more than just uh, one reason, more, I, uh, a judge is faster. <laughs> You don't go through a day, two days of picking a jury. 
I mean, you go down there, she hears your side, she hears his side, and here's the facts, you know, on both sides, and uh, she makes a decision. Let's see what Black's Law Dictionary said. This is a law dictionary that many, many lawyers uh, rely on. Uh, peers. Peers. Equals. Those who are man's equal, equals in rank and station. Thus, trial by a jury of his peers means trial by jury of citizens judgment of his peers. I, I suppose um, being tried by your fellow citizens, non-lawyers, rather than being tried uh, by the judge trained in the law. You know, the very interesting thing about the Watson case, the jury selection, is that um, his particular panel, in fact, consisted of all white, middle class, middle-aged people. But the average jury does not. It's very seldom that I get a jury panel on a jury case that does not have at least uh, one Negro, one Hispano. We had a jury yesterday or the day before with uh, two minority people on it. Uh, this is the usual thing, but you can, um, well, let's just, let's just say I'm happier to have a jury of six of his peers, of his white peers, decide it rather than one judge. Without getting too tangled up on what the word peer means, it is worth asking what kind of jury do we think Lauren Watson should have. At the extremes, I suppose it looks easy. He shouldn't have a jury of friends and supporters or of people who have active hostility or bias against him. And if we have a mix of those groups, we can confidently predict a hung jury and the need for a new trial. Thus, the obvious answer is to get citizens of Denver who simply have no commitments or biases at all. But this fails to take account of the growing sense of division and bitterness, particularly in our cities. If a defendant believes that if you're not for me, you're against me, and if he feels that no white man can fairly judge a black man, or that no one over 30 can judge a young person, he is unlikely to accept the notion that this so-called uncommitted group can give him a fair hearing. It's a serious dilemma for our system of justice. But even without facing this ultimate dilemma, one cannot help noting that from Mr. Watson's point of view, the courtroom must look pretty darn white. Tomorrow, when Mr. Davies decides whether or not to waive the jury, and Mr. Morgan begins to prosecute the city's case, the next stage of the trial begins. Heavy build, medium complexion, black brown hair with gray, 